Um, so I'm Yay. going to actually introduce Christopher Theophanides. Chris, will you wave or say hi or something so you come back to the um, or yeah, let me get him unmuted. Okay. You're unmuted now, Christopher. Oh, wait, let me try again. There you go. You're unmuted. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> Great to be here with everybody. I don't see you. Oh. You want me to try to see if I can pull him up? Yeah, just because I wanted to see him when I introduced him, if that's possible. Oh, there, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay. So we'll leave it on him for a minute while I'm introducing him and then we can come back to me. But okay. um, so I just wanted to introduce Chris because he is the composer whose work these poems are based on. And um, I'll introduce him and then I'll tell you a little bit about the project. But um, Chris and I met in Minnesota Key um, at the Hermitage Residency the Hermitage, Hermitage Retreat, and he's a composer, and he's very interested in poetry and literature, and um, so he had done this composition based on the Conference of the Birds, and um, asked me to write poems, so this is how this all sort of came to be, but he's an amazing uh, composer. His work is uh, spiritual and beautiful and full and lush and I can't even say enough good things about it and um, he let me see the the technical stuff he teaches at Yale and his um, work Rainbow Body was one of the most it is one of the most or maybe the most played uh, composition in the United States and maybe even in the world um, so he's just if you don't if you're not familiar with his music I highly recommend going and listening to it so um, what else? I don't know what else to say. He's wonderful. <laughs> Chris, did I miss anything important about you? No, you said too many things, actually, but thank you very much. And it's really great to be with everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, for me, a, an amazing circle of people to be among. I mean, I have written um, music based on poetry all my life and a lot of contemporary poets, but um, in this way, it was kind of an amazing thing that I, I wrote, had written a piece already that was responding to Atar's uh, Conference of the Birds. And then after the fact, one of the quartet members, the string quartet asked me, it would it be possible to pair some poetry with it? And Melissa and I had met very recently before that, and it seemed like a great way to uh, connect and kind of work on a project together. And so she responded to my music and also Atar's poetry. So it was kind of a three-way conversation and the neat thing is, I think since that, that time, the piece has kind of evolved also in the way it's being performed is, has been evolved and we're doing it with some readings interspersed with some of the movements and so forth. So it's just been a great ride all the way through. Do you want to tell a little bit about the Conference of the Birds before we start? I mean, I think most people are probably familiar, but just... Yeah, well, I mean, it's a 13th century um, poem, uh, kind of uh, epic poem that basically talks about um, a, a kind of a metaphoric journey towards understanding of the divine. And the, the premise is that the, this, you know, the basically all the birds of the earth convene in this place and decide that they need a leader um, in the form of this distant Samor, who is this giant bird god essentially that in, in order to get to this to the Samorg, they have to go through these seven valleys and the seven valleys are seven valleys of understanding and so um what they realize as they get there of course is that 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 the the unity is actually the divine it's not the destiny in a way and so that was very appealing uh i think to all of our sensibilities in a, in a sense who are involved in the project and really inform the music a lot too, because I kind of think of flocking motions and um, you know, schooling motions and kind of one mind motions in musical relationships uh, in trying to create that sensibility in the music too. So it's highly interdependent thinking. Okay, thank you, that's lovely. So I'll just say what I did with the book is because the Conference of the Birds is already a narrative piece, rather than trying to write narrative poems that told the story that was already in place, I instead responded to Chris's music. And the, the birds fly over the seven valleys of understanding that he mentioned. And so he has 
the, the movements are each based on one of the seven valleys. So I wrote these pieces about the valleys responding to his music about the valleys. So <laughs> all these layers of inspiration. So I'll show you what it looks like. This is the cover. Um, Ron got this amazing, amazing artist named Alyssa Vendraman to do this cover. And when I start reading, you'll see how perfect it is for the book. And I want to show you also that um, throughout there are little, there are all kinds of things in here. We've got quotes from um, Chalet Wolpe's translations of the original Atar. We've got these little details of the birds Alyssa painted to go all throughout. We've got fragments of Chris's musical scores. And then we've got the poems that I wrote. So I'm going to go ahead and read a few of the poems to you and then we can talk more or people can ask questions or whatever. So do y'all want to hear some poems? <laughs> okay, good. Um, okay, so I'll just start with the first one. When the bird song rings human. Oh, and I guess in order to hear this poem, I'm, I guess with each poem I should tell you what you need to know to understand it. The hoopy bird, if you're not familiar with this, is the bird who's the leader, who's taking everyone to find the divine bird that they're looking for. When the bird song rings human, the hoopy bird forgets its tongue, like a time traveler accidentally leaving a glove in a year that hasn't happened. The tongue wanders strange gray streets, its sweet and sour buds lit up with the hoopy's hunger, glowing like a jellyfish in the rain. Now the tongue knows no house can promise safety, not the sheath of mouth, not even the body, which laughs at the body of time, stretched like a poolside wizard across dimensions. The tongue bellows for the hoopy across the green. The hoopy hears what he thinks is an echo, not blazing, but persistent, ever present, a little fuzzy, like the radio that's not coming in well, or the hum and buzz of the street lamps and telephone wires he knew in that other world. Everything the bird needs to say turns ancient at the root and falls off, because God is not a clock nor a sundial, reaching forward with narrow arms. God is a million tiny pieces, like glitter or destiny, breaking flesh into astonishment, breaking pain into daggers of light. Okay, so that was the first one. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about the structure of the book, and then I'll read the next poem. So I, created this book, I wanted it to have this sort of interdependent flocking uh, emotion and feel that Chris was talking about with the musical composition wound up into the poems. So I responded to the character of each of the musical pieces, which each one was different. But then I also created this so that the first line of all of the poems would make a new poem that was the final poem in the book. So. <laughs> Um, this one is called, There's a Brightness Folded into Every Bird. There's a brightness folded into every bird, but the bird doesn't know it. The bird is 30 birds who soared out of dreaming to invent the sky. 30 birds flying in the formation of a bird. God tells them, open, O moonbeak, O silver black, O sliver of luck. And the bird says, break me until I'm whole. God says empty, and the bird spills a splendor of jewels from their 30 beaks into the valley. Don't think I'm a diamond, God says. Find me, and hands the bird a map back to the inside of their own bone. Then disappears. But the bird doesn't understand the question. 30 birds split into a thousand that search under everything, stone, fabric, sun face, gold, until they find no God. Now the beak yells, take me, I have no reason. 
and an arch of green lifts sun up towards the light, and a thump under the chest answers yes, and yes, and yes, and yes. So now you see why the cover is so perfect <laughs> for this book. Okay, I'll read maybe two more. Is that good? Okay, this one is for the Valley of Love. I'm just going in order. It's called Like Shining from Chook Foil. And I, this title comes from a Gerard Manley Hopkins poem. I just loved that line and I thought, I've got to, you know, we're not collaborative enough already with an artist, a composer, <laughs> an original poet. I have to bring in more. So here it is. Like Shining from Chook Foil. You're in a valley and flying. You know a thousand other words for behold, a hundred thousand for Dappledale. Below, a century begins and ends, and no one remembers the details. You mistake a sheep's sigh for sadness and fall in love with the sound of a cloud emanating from lungs. You mistake a horse's whinny for winter and stop for a hundred years to build and stoke a fire to keep the horse warm. You are a bird, no 30 birds, no a thousand. Your wings flame to flight, arching and lifting, wimpling and waving. Soon the movement lifts you and you are one again with the wonder of dappled light. You coax honey from a topaz stone and feed it to a cloud. Love will break you into the gift of your life. Give it to everyone you meet. There's no right or wrong here, only warmth rushing from you like embers to the wind. That um, poem I wrote partially because if you listen to that particular movement of Chris's, at the end of it, it, it has that sound almost like it's just embers are, are floating out into the wind. It's really beautiful. So, do you want to hear one more? Okay. Um, let's decide if I want to read the next one or a different one. I think I'll just read the next one. Why not? Okay. Yes, I'll read it. It's called like a diamond with no answer or a key that opens all the locks. And who has not at one point scraped the bottom of self to invent a new self? Who has not dropped the diamond to pick up a ruby, dropped the ruby to scoop a peridot from a pea pod? One bird tosses another, a gold set pearl of wisdom. The bird drops it and another picks it up, rolls it across a talon and into a beak, tosses it up, up, like a golden bracelet twisting on its chains. One link is the hoopy bird wending into ignorance. One is the parrot forgetting what to say. One is the peacock fanning out unseen eyes. Everything they thought they knew turns tarnished at the tip and drifts off. Who will answer the question? Who will answer the question no one asked? Look at me, God says, holding up a key. And the bird spills a schoolhouse of jewels from their mouth. Wow. Thank you. I unmuted uh, everybody so you can hear us. Oh, that was just gorgeous. I kind of want you to read more. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only one. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we're having an open mic, so if you want me to read another one or two after people have had a chance sure. to read, I'll be happy to do that. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so very much. No, that was just gorgeous. And I know everybody now is understanding why um, I'm so taken with your work. I mean, the lush images and just the way that you write. I, I wanted to talk about the process because... Um, a lot of your poems seem to like build up with sensual images and then have um, these statements that are just so sincere and powerful. And I know somebody was writing down a couple of them. Oh, somebody else put please another. Uh, like a diamond with no answer was what stuck out for somebody. 
Um, but there's a, quite a few comments in the chat section if you want to glance at that. Oh, sure. Um, How do I open it? <laughs> so if you go down to the bottom, there's a little dialogue um, box right oh, in the see. middle. And Thank just hit the chat and you'll be able to scroll through it. And also, if people have questions, you're welcome to go ahead and ask them um, in the, either the chat section or just go ahead and ask um, by just talking. Make sure that you're unmuted first, though. We won't hear you otherwise. Thank you. I'll let you catch up with some of the um, comments. Most of the people were just going stunning, <laughs> absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Daggers of light, I, that stuck, struck me as well. Oh, that's um, so nice. <laughs> So did, I'm sorry, I, I was reading those and listening to you at the same time. Did you ask a question that I didn't answer or? Um, no, no, it looks like the, okay, um, somebody was, I'm trying to see if somebody had written a question down at the bottom, Melissa, we're good. Does anybody have any questions for Melissa about her process or about particular poems? Well, I'm going to go ahead and ask one. Um, I like how collaboratively you work and you seem to, now are you a visual artist as well? Yes. Am I a visual artist? Yes. No, no, I'm okay. not. I mean, I would like to be. <laughs> I was you know, curious someday. because you seem to have like a very visual uh, world that you build. And so I wasn't sure if that was a sensibility that you had. Um, somebody here has asked, what is your revision process? Frank wants to know what is your revision process? Okay, uh, well, it's sort of different from project to project and poem to poem. So um, I, I try not to actually revise too much. I try to just sort of write as I go along, but I consider the revision process to actually really be part of the creative process itself. So for instance, if I see somewhere in a poem that I want to add more or I want to change something, um, I will take like a piece of paper and just free write on it for a page or two and then go and sort of find what I like in there and bring it back in. So I, for me, I think when I try to like come up with a title or do something small, I tend to get sort of stuck. But if I allow myself to just be free and flow as much as I want, then it's a lot easier. So when I revise, I do it in a writing way, like I'm writing again. I don't just sit there and nitpick with things. Well, I take that back. Of course, I nitpick <laughs> I'm a writer, but uh, for the most part, I don't. For the most part, I just really try to just keep it really fluid. And the, the titles even that I come up with usually are something that I've extracted from a part of the poem that wasn't working. Um, I'm very, um, let me see how to say this exactly. I'm very much uh, not attached to my own work. <laughs> no, it sounds like a weird thing to say, but um, I, I think in order to be sort of in the flow state that allows me to create, I have to feel comfortable with the fact that I can just throw away a lot of my work or that I can write something and, and maybe it's gorgeous, maybe it's one of the best lines in the poem, but if it doesn't fit in the poem, then I can pull it out. and. I actually have a file that I save of all the things that I've cut out and sometimes I use those as seeds to start new poems and I just, you know, have sort of a, a flow attitude about it, so. I think that's a very open way to let it work with you so that you're not attached to something, you kind of let the poem build itself. Yeah. Um, there was another question about um, how did being at the Hermitage together lead y'all to collaborate is what Josh is asking. Chris, do you want to talk a little or do you want me yeah, to jump sure. in? Hi, everyone again. Um, uh, I think when you, that situation was very particular. You're with somebody kind of for several weeks every day, as many of you probably have been at residencies and things, um, and you cook together, you do all these things. Um, uh, and I think the things that you end up sharing there are little glimpses into your personality in kind of concentrated ways. And um, we all listen to each other's work and uh, read and had com kind of communal things. So I think there was a very strong starting point for a collaboration that sometimes you don't get when you reach out professionally to somebody um, because you admire their work and, and, and that. So once we got started, it was um, quite, an, uh, quite a wonderful process. And I think what Melissa just said about 
um, not being too precious with things was one of the greatest assets in this thing because we were trying to figure out, this is basically, um, uh, in the context of the string quartet is kind of a performative work. So it's meant to be done in stage and in kind of a theater. And so to try to figure out how to present it was half the battle. And you know, how much is too much? Do you overdo it by reading whole poems? Do you overdo it by playing all of the music? You know, you have to you have to be flexible in those moments, as, as she said, and talk and go with the flow in some ways. It was a real learning experience. But the Hermitage was kind of, uh, I think, the rock on which uh, the collaboration is built on. And we are now collaborating on two other projects as well. So. Thank you. And I want to say I probably should have mentioned this before you started talking, but Josh was at the Hermitage with me the week before you got there. Y'all missed each other by like 12 hours. So <laughs> I love it that Josh asked that question. Hi, Josh. <laughs> so, and I wanted to add also that we did something, our group that was there at that time uh, with Chris and me and um, Patrick Harlan, Leslie um, Pazit. Chirik, hard time saying her name, and um, Anne um, all had like a studio night and we went around to each other's studios and shared our work. And I think that also kind of opened us up for collaboration because that's something I didn't do with any of the other groups at the Hermitage. It was just something that we sort of dreamed up because Anne was leaving early and um, we wanted to just have a special night the night before she left. And then, um, so that just kind of led to us becoming infatuated with each other's work and wanting to work together. And I think also they did know, they, they saw me there and saw that I was a, a working poet and in the sense that um, I would be able to sort of you know, if they wanted me to change things, I wasn't going to be like, no, this is from my heart. I won't change anything. They knew that I would shift things around and do what was in the best interest of the overall performance. So, and some poets um, don't feel that way. And that, I don't think that's a problem. I think that's fine that some poets feel very much that uh, once they've written it and gotten it where they want it to be, that's it. Um, but just to give you a little sense of uh, what we've done with this, we have the poems in the book, but we also have another entire, uh, completely different version of all of it. So wow. we created a different uh, performances that would be different lengths of time. So we have a short one that's little fragments from this. We've got one that's a little bit longer and then we've got the full length because the, the way this really came about in the first place was that a quartet, the Argus Quartet, it's A-R-G-U-S, they're wonderful, uh, were performing Chris's piece and they thought that they would like to have some poems um, to read between the uh, the movements of the piece. And so they wrote to him and then he came to me. But um, so, um, oh my God, why was I talking about that? I totally lost my train of thought. Keep at it, keep at it. Well, I think it's about the process and how things kind of flowed together after meeting at the Hermitage, how oh, this built you. upon itself. Thank you. Yes. So the point that I was trying to make is that when they get, when Argus gets invited to perform somewhere, depending on what the venue is and who's hosting it, people have different lengths of time that they want the performances to take. So yeah. we wanted to create versions of this so that no matter what Argus was doing, they could make it work. Awesome. Thank you. You are getting so many interesting questions here. Here's a, a, a one that I love. Did these poems change you? This is from Lo uh, Lois. Oh, Lois. <laughs> yes. Yes, uh, they did. The, first, I have to say the music changed me because it's so beautiful. And then writing the poems changed me too. And I wrote them very quickly. I wrote them in probably about maybe a week and a half to two weeks. So this whole project was very, very fast. Um, so I wrote the poems quickly and then uh, I, I did it because they were going to be performed. At that point, I wasn't thinking of it as a book yet. And then we started talking a little bit later and realized that it might be nice for people to have something to come away from the performance with. So we decided to make a book and I contacted Ron because Ron's books are 
beautiful physically, as you've seen, and, and he's wonderful to work with. So I also want to say Ron put this entire book together in the course of about a month. I mean, it was probably two months from the time that I contacted him, but it was a month of actually working on it because he went to Italy for a month and then came back and we made the book. And it was just amazing the way it all came together. But I think I want to answer a little bit to maybe how they changed me, uh, because I think that's probably what Lois really wants to know. And um, I think as a poet, sometimes it's easy to get into writing about the self and writing about how I feel about things personally and that kind of thing. And these, and I, I want to be universal anyway, but these poems brought me out of myself in a way that made me feel really connected um, to sort of a, an oversoul or universal fabric. I mean, what, what the, the book is about, the original book, it fed me because it's beautiful. And um, I, it was with me through, through the entire process of writing it. I think that's how I was able to do it so quickly. That's lovely. And, and, and she had another question, which I think you kind of started to answer, but I'll, I'll go ahead and put it in there because I think it is kind of telling us what drew you to this. But um, she also asked, was there a voice within Chris's music that spoke to you? The voice within Chris's music that spoke to me? Oh, that's so interesting. I mean, there aren't lyrics, so I know that's not what Lois means. <laughs> Lo Lois is so metaphorical. Um, I don't know if I would call it a voice. It was a more like a pulse. It was like a yeah. like a a feeling, a pulse, an energy, a um, a movement. Um, the beauty. <laughs> there was so many things, but I don't, I don't know that it was actually a voice. Can it I was say, a generosity. It was, there was a generosity in the music that, that buoyed me. Chris, you look like you wanted to add something to that? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, and I see Ron's question too, can you talk about the collaborative process, perhaps? Um, I think, you know, usually, uh, in my field, it works in reverse in the sense that we seek out poems to set usually with vocal settings or we might respond. I've responded to many poems uh, abstractly in music too. Um, and some of those are actually rights issues. You can't um, set um, four quartets, for example, I found out. Um, but, you know, finding those things. Uh, but the idea of responding to something is uh, kind of a universal genre, cross genre. Uh, thing and if you have a thousand people responding to the valley of detachment you're going to get a, a thousand different voices threaded through that and that's I think one of the super interesting things is to see what comes out of somebody responding to the valley of detachment or the valley of wonderment or something like that or even the translation of the word wonderment in Farsi you know that that Cholet chose that particular word is kind of an interesting choice and the the thing that that single word evokes it turns out that that one word was the whole basis for the emotive feeling of that movement for my music in particular. And what uh, Melissa would key into in the music might be a very specific thing, but she was also working at a great disadvantage because at, the, at that time when she started writing this, there was no acoustic recording of this or anything like that. I was doing kind of computer realizations of the pieces for her so she could get some idea that her imagination didn't, didn't limit that at all, which was kind of terrific. So. Well, thank you. Um, I wanted to say also that one of the things that I kept in mind as I wrote each piece was I would listen to the, the piece that it was based on, but then I would also listen to the pieces that came right before and after it because I wanted like, you know, whether they read my piece, my poem right before or after a movement, I wanted it to be fluid into the one before or after it. So there was a lot to think about. I mean, it's really all I did for a few weeks. <laughs> That's awesome. 
But it's really great to hear from different voices and different perspectives. Um, there's another question that, let me see if I can get to this in the chat section. It was how much does a technical knowledge of music inform the poems? Not at all. I don't, I mean, I know about the music more as a, um, just an aesthetic response to it. Um, and I love music and I, I dance and I love to dance and all of that, but I don't actually read music. So I had to listen to it over and over and over. And um, Chris also was generous enough to spend time explaining to me what he meant to do with each movement. And so before he did that, I had already written all kinds of just sort of free write responses to the music. So once I was able to sort of incorporate what I knew he was trying to do with and the technical things that he taught me, he, he did teach me a lot um, technically. And um, I just incorporated that with what I was already feeling as a response. And, yeah. I think a lot of people have questions about the actual making of the poems because the, the next one kind of comes into that too. How difficult is it to build a collection of work that responds both to individual movements and the entire score? Oh, that's a good question. I, I really took it piece by piece. Uh, that was the, because I have a tendency to get overwhelmed if I try to think about too many things all at the same time. So I just really focused piece by piece. Uh, with the, the trust that it would come together as a whole. And also because I am so fluid in the revision process, I knew that anything that wasn't okay in the original composition, I would just change. <laughs> so. Yeah, I like that you're very open about that because that is a hard thing. I mean, I, I know a lot of teachers say something like, you know, you have to be willing to throw away your babies, but a lot of us have a hard time just allowing that freedom of movement within a poem. Mm -hmm. um, I know Ron wanted to read a poem and I'm checking, I don't see any other questions. Did I miss any uh, questions that people had for Melissa? Because I don't want to cut you off too soon if there's something you had. And I know at some point, Paul, I saw you had a question, but I can't find it now. So uh, I'm unmuting you. Yeah, do you okay. want to ask it directly? It's really about, uh, did you go to the, to, uh, the Volpe translation? Uh, when you did your writing, were you also reading, going straight from the music, or were you also working from the various translations? I actually, yes, I worked with many different translations. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I listened to one version, I read Wolfe's translation, I read like another translation or two, and I, I sat there with them side by side and compared them to get the best feel that I could of mm -hmm. what was going on with each of the, the valleys. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually I decided that for the sake of coherence and consistency, I wanted to use Chalet's translations. Mm -hmm. And she had done a lot of things with the translations that I thought were really important. Uh, for instance, in the original language, uh, pronouns are not gendered. And so some of the other translations had gendered the bird, whereas Chalet didn't. So there were things like that that she did that were really important to me. So I decided to stick with that translation as the, the okay. final um, basis. And um, also, I mean, Chile is a, a beautiful poet in her own right. So between the, the music and poetry that she brought to the translation, it just seemed like an e easy choice for me. I asked because years ago, there weren't many translations. You were sort of stuck with Fitzgerald and some prose versions. <laughs> stuck with Fitzgerald. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I understand <laughs> some of those older translations are a little stiff. <laughs> well, they're, you know, it's done by Victorians for Victorians. So right, yeah, right. In the case of Fitzgerald, yeah. Mm. But, and hers is much livelier and more open and is actually from a native speaker, even though it's 13th century, so the language is pretty different. Right, right. So thanks a lot. I really love yeah. hearing. Thank you for asking that. Thank you, Paul. Um, I just love this quote. Um, Michael wrote, Melissa, this isn't a question, but I will never look at glitter the same way. 
Thank you. Isn't that That's lovely? what we want, right? When somebody reads something for them to never look yeah. at something the same way again. It changes something forever, a perspective. It's beautiful. Um, a couple people have said, sorry, um, they have to leave or um, they had to check out, put kids to bed. Um, so I want uh, the, the chat section I can actually send to you, Melissa. So I'll do that at the very Thank you. Uh, you know, after this is over. That way you can kind of at your leisure look through. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say it looks like there are no more questions. And so we will move on to the open mic. I know Ron wanted to read a Rumi poem. Ron, can we put you on now to read that? If you would kind of kick off the open mic, that would be awesome. Thank you so very much, Melissa. And you're going to read again in my open mic. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Ron. One of the reasons that I just love this project is because since the last since the 1980s, I have been a lover of Sufism and an appreciation of Sufism. Um, spent a lot of time reading a lot of the writings and the writers about Sufism. So this is a poem I wrote a few years ago, but it's about Rumi. And it really, I think it ties into Attar's work um, well. So this is a poem, a poem called Rumi. Beginning in the first moments after the Sufi poet Rumi was born, pieces of him over time began dissolving into all the elements of earth, like sugar and water. And to this very day, he is with us still. We breathe his breath in the air. We taste his words in food grown from our good earth. We find the essence of his verses floating like seeds of light locked inside the molecules from his body and being in the very water we drink. His verses, when spoken out loud, are an invocation to the Holy Spirit. They ripen us like wheat for a harvest of the heart. His words are written inside the chambers of our hearts like a holy sacrament. He who searched for God the Beloved, or Allah, if you wish, in church and shrine and mosque, to find him finally tucked inside the pocket of his own heart. Can we, as Christian, Jew, or Muslim, or any faith, do any less to bring an everlasting peace into the world, to be as one? Oh, good, thanks. I'm unmuted so everybody can, because I know people want to clap and it takes a moment. Thank you so much, Ron. That is beautiful. That is awesome. We, um, so I have Craig listed and I noticed, Jeannie, did you get the question answered about where to publish, I mean, to um, buy the book? It's good to see people asking where to buy it. That's good. Yes, yes, I did. Thank you. Um, Paul, Sorry. Put it Wonderful. In, in the chat. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Um, I have Craig is wanting to read. I'm going to mute everybody and I'll come to you, Craig. Okay. And Craig, you are unmuted. And let me see if I can have you um, the spotlight video. There we go. You're on. Okay. And I'm unmuted. Yes, correct. You're unmuted. Cool. Uh, this is a, actually, this is a very fresh one, just wrote over the last week or so. Uh, it's called Gods Eventually Fall Silent. There's snakes in these woods, you know. I saw two of them yesterday, one in pursuit of the other, flowing, flowing like water made flesh. Wild bird calls change faster than mind can conceptualize the notes into identifications and drain their songs of magic. All these dark, empty spaces, chairs upside down like dead roaches. How long will it take us to weave new myths to fill in the gaps? I spent the last sunny minutes trying to zap a cloud from the sky, my attention fixed on its form with an invitation to let go. Oh, nice. That was great. It's Thank you, Craig. Great. This is awesome. The theme of the night, too, is great. Mm -hmm. Nice. 
Um, I think, Karen, you're the next one that wanted to read, and I will head towards you. Okie doke. Um, where are you there? Oh, you got me started. <laughs> oh, hey, Laura. All right. <laughs> We're just bouncing around, guys. Hang on. Let me let me get that spotlight going. Karen, don't go anywhere. Say oh, something so I'm I've got you. Yeah. <laughs> Stay right there. <laughs> bless, you. Oh, bless you. Thank you. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> okay, I think I got it. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, guys, technical difficulties. Oh, you're rocking it, Malika. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <sighs> All right, this is some fresh ink. Oh, never know. Okay. Um, this is from lexico.com to still not there yet. You are Latin in origin, 16th century, when you were many things at once a crown or anything resembling something like a crown. In astronomical terms, you are a rarefied sight normally visible only during solar eclipses. More simply, you are a small circle of light. Architecturally, you are a part of a cornice and you have a broad vertical face. Botanically speaking, you are actually the cup of the trumpet-shaped center of the bloom of a daffodil or of a narcissus. These are words about a word. You are not a word. Magnified, I don't know how many times, in full color you look like some kind of a modern art flower, exotic and exuberantly blooming. But I will not paint you as modern art or astronomically, architecturally, botanically, or even as a beer. I will paint you only with my pen on this paper in words struggling to find simile or metaphor or anything at all which might bring about any kind of peace. But these are just words. These are words about a word. You are not a word. You are virus. Wow. Woohoo. Refreshing. <laughs> right awesome. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, guys. Beautiful. Um, what an ending. I've got um, Robbie wants to read. Let me see if I can find you. I'm going to mute everybody and then I will come to Robbie. Hold on just a moment. Let's see if I can find you. There we go. You are unmuted and I will pull you up as video. Hello. Okay. Hi. Hi. I've got a tiny little poem uh, from the point of view of an LP. LP. The needle drops and music rises. A voice I never knew I had. Without the stylus prying out the notes, I'm no one, spinning in the silent world around my spindle. As the notes unfold, I think that this must be the way a nightingale erupts in song, announcing I exist. Thanks. What is lovely. Thank you all. So it is so wonderful to um, hear everybody's work. Thank you for reading. Um, the next person I have that would like to read is Michael. So I will come to you, Michael, in just a moment. You ready, Michael? Yeah. Thank you. Um, this poem is entitled In Praise of Green Blades. <clears throat> Winter begins to relieve itself about this time of year. Snow melts in the mountains and trickles down until it becomes something big enough to talk about. The migration of many birds is screwed up. They must know. I can hardly count the ones that have overstayed their visas. It's still, it's a melancholy time, which will pass Baseball starts, 
and ushers in hope. It's as much a part of the cycle of life as the spontaneity of green blades across the lawn. This is when my mind will migrate back to a better place. It's how nature heals the soul. Oh, we've got a theme going. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so very much. Um, I have, uh, Holly, I'm sorry if you get dropped off. Her phone has got a low battery, so hopefully we won't lose you. Lindsay, um, I have you unmuted, and I'm going to put you as the spotlight video, if that's okay. That's okay, yeah. I just want to uh, Thank just want you. To the poem. Thank you. This is a short poem I wrote um, recently. It's called In Gloom, Praise To. I celebrate snowmelt, sand hill cries, breathe on my tattooed sleeves. I celebrate the rebirth of our dead who tread on lakes ice, cataract white. I celebrate fields during this blight poised to wipe out nations of people. Isolated, no gloves or mask, I celebrate every living breath. This morning I dared to hike the mountain, no dust to kick up like clapped erasers. Light stippled the unearthed roots and leaves dazzled like stardust. I dared celebrate those flashy leaves whose vacillations ushered my path to you, passed from our world theater, you shucked disease for freedom. With luck, I'll see the dead in lilacs, whose barrel chests puff and swagger, who pulse, fragrance, gush, color. With luck, I'll see them in the neighbor's nair, who breaks loose to splash in the lake, hooves bucking up white fireworks, tame enough to respect danger and wild enough to give way to praise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you. Right. Oh, I love that. Yeah, oh, we've got an echo, guys. <laughs> um, let's see if we can cut that down. Um, so that's the last I had written down for people that were willing to read for open mic. So, uh, we get to do an encore with Melissa. Yes. Um, all right, if I don't see anybody put something up in the chat section, then Melissa, can we come back to you, please? <laughs> sure, sure. Do we want more Wonderful. from this book? Yes, please. Okay. I'll keep going. I, before I read, though, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's here and everyone who read. Uh, your book was beautiful, and it feels uh, like so much more of a celebration to have you join me in reading. And I like it that we're all on this theme. <laughs> so, and thank you, Monica. I mean... Oh, this, it's been my pleasure. Yeah. Are you going to read? Um, you know, I'm not because I, I just did a book launch last time and I really want to read. They, these people have hurt. Most of these people have to deal with me all the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Give them a break. And I'm, sure the video. <laughs> <laughs> I'm muting everybody as we go. So we don't have a feedback. Okay, the next poem is really kind of a short one. It's based on the Valley of Detachment. It's called the, who, who Will Hear You From So Far Across the Sky. Self is the place we keep getting sewn back into. We fly away, it sews us back. We tear the fabric, here comes the needle. Try falling down the well of yourself, little clicks along the way, little bright spots before the dark. It happens more slowly than you previously thought. Dismantle your bones and build a new God. So, the Conference of the Birds, if you don't know it that well, at the end, the birds all discover that they are similar to the God they're searching for. So the divinity that they're seeking is actually within themselves. So that's what I was thinking of when I wrote the end of that poem. 
The next one is called The Body is the Song, and it's based on the Valley of Unity. Now, God has filled you with singing birds. God has filled the singing birds with you. A ruby-throated chirp lifts from an emerald-lined limb. An orange-throated warble wafts from a Larimar sky. Then all the birds turn towards the center of you, quiet. Through gauzy, wind-blown curtains, you see flashes of light. Dancing rays spun round a spinning child. Beneath the blooming green gauge plums, beneath the drift of dandelion puff, you are the child, and the child is you. Who is the bird song? Who is the emerald? Who is the light? Consume the shimmering false distance between yourself and everything you see, so that you may be a conduit to bring these warm, pulsing wonders to the world, still breathing and throbbing with life. Mm -hmm. Nice. Wow. Well, okay. One more? Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, so this is based on the Valley of Wonderment, and it's called Leave All the Windows of Your Soul Cracked Open. This one is, um, I adapted it from a poem that I had previously written. Um, okay, so Leave All the Windows of Your Soul Cracked Open. Stretch your wings wide as God's first breath. From tip to tip, there is no time. Just the rumbling of a tune in your makeshift feet and bright sky galloping through the hollow of bone. Bucket of air, spine built from light. Bird full of flutters and drafts. You speak mountain stream, laurel leaf, rolling cloud the dialect of flight. The world drifts like a current inside you, rivers, trees, and hills, feathers, wings, and light, the start and end of time, rowing through blood's currents, sailing inside the freedom of mind. Now split open by a whirlwind of cone, pushed like air through sky's vast lung. I, I, I wish you could see the comments as they're coming up. You know, people have been writing this has been the highlight of my week. I love this project. Beautifully oh read. Gosh, that's so so great to see and hear Chris too. You are both gifted and have gifted us. Really beautiful thing. Oh, that's th that's so sweet. Thank you. I'm just so happy for everyone that's here. Yeah. I feel like right now. It's so important for us to keep coming together and sharing in these ways. And, you know, um, one of the blessings about something like this is that people can be here who wouldn't be able to be here if we had done it in person. So that's a gift for me. I want to echo that because for me, um, you know, we've been doing this um, on Thursdays now. I think this is our sixth one. And uh, it's the highlight of my week, and and um, I'm very fortunate that uh, you said yes, and that you brought Ron and Christopher with you, and that we had this really great interactive experience. So I'm I'm deeply grateful to everybody that has been in attendance. There were 28 people at one point. <laughs> wow. wow. So I hope people will look up how to buy the book from St. Julian Press. Um, amazing open mic, guys, once again. Thank you so very much. Oh, I'm on an echo. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say thank you so very much, Ron, Christopher, Melissa. It's so great to like actually hear you read. Yeah. To me, this is in person. It feels very personable. It does. It uh, does. Thank you all. Yes, thank you. Susan, you have a lovely backdrop to your uh, picture, so the heart that you did was lovely. <laughs> Susan, <laughs> I see you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you so okay, very much. Bye Be you. well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Oh, look, hey, you're kind of scrolling through bye, everybody. Melissa. That's really cool. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 bye.
<laughs> Melissa, I'll put this up on your web, uh, on your Facebook page with the oh, uh, recording. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I so appreciate you. Thank you. Likewise. Like Ron, that. nice to have met you virtually. Christopher, likewise. Um, thank you all so very much. Thank you, Malika. See you next week. Thank you, Malika. Next week. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. I see you, Liz.